which is CJDNS and the evolution of that into the packet project. It's January 12, 2020, and uh, welcome to the decade of decentralized ownership of internet infrastructure. I want to start off with that. And this, this has a couple of significant aspects. One is that I'm talking in decades, and this is a very, I'm going, what I'm going to present to you is a very ambitious project, and I want it to be understood that while the, the long-term vision of this project is very ambitious, success only means that we need to get a little bit closer to our final goal. So this is going to be a project that takes decades, and it goes back to the beginning of CJDNS, which was in 2012. And this other concept of this in this statement here is decentralized ownership of internet infrastructure. And this is a, a technological shift, which is independent. It's bigger than any one project. And while I have a lot of uh, confidence in this project, I have even more confidence in the uh, in the technological the fundamentals of the technological shift itself. So I'm going to present you the, the vision and then the implementation, and the vision is going to be presented in three phases. There's going to be the, the morality aspect, why we should be involved in this, why this is something that we should believe in and we should want to have happen, and then the efficiency aspect, which is why this project and this these technological changes are something that I think are going to happen because of economic economic pressure, the, the economy is going to want this to happen, and agility, which means the ability of a, a technology to last in the long term and not be disrupted by other things which will be happening at the same time. And then I'll get into the implementation, and uh, that is CJDNS, packet crypt, the packet blockchain, the governance, and then the plan. So just kind of a, a really high level of what we're looking to do is we're looking to change the ownership of internet infrastructure to be something that is owned by the people and by separating the role of a hardware provider, an infrastructure provider, somebody who plugs in fiber, somebody who um, runs the systems from the role of a network operator, which is somebody who is planning a global network. And traditionally, those two roles are unified inside of the ISP, and by separating them, we can make ownership of internet infrastructure something that anybody can do. So why? why? Why do we do this? Why do we want to get involved in this? Why is this something that we would vote for? The idea here is we want a, an internet with no single point of failure, an internet by and for the people, and it's about maximizing individual agency, and agency means that you have choice in your life and you have control over your data and how you use the network and also part of this project is about making internet access as close to free as possible as cheap as possible that obviously you could do that by just having the government give you the internet but that is a single point of failure because if you allow a president to decide what your internet is going to be then they can start deciding what kind of information you should be able to access so it's it's my opinion that this is something that must be outside of the control of any one government. And finally, I, I believe that making the internet access as close to free as possible, part of that is changing the pay for access, pay to connect to the internet, changing that model to a pay for priority. So pay for it to be faster because there, on the internet there is tons of unused bandwidth. There's just enormous amounts of bandwidth that is capacity that's available and it's, it's not used. And if we make it pay for priority, then if you're willing to have slow internet or spotty internet, then we can actually make that free. So some, some non-objectives, um, some things that we don't really want to do here, and th these are things that people ask about. Um, making it anonymous, it's not, that's not an objective, and there's some reasons why. One of them is that when you make something anonymous, in order to make an anonymous network like Tor or like I2P, um, it just needs to be less efficient. You need to bounce traffic around the network, and when you do that, everything gets slow. And 
And um, when people don't want it to be slow, and people who are not interested in anonymity are going to say, why is it slow? And if we say to them, well, you should want it to be slow because that's what makes more freedom, well, that's not giving them freedom. And, and that goes against the idea of maximizing agency. So we really need to give people choice in whether they want to be part of an anonymous network or not. And anonymity is complex. It's really, it's a difficult problem. And you can have security surprises that something that you didn't expect to happen and then all of a sudden, well, it's not as anonymous as you thought. And we want to build robust technology that lasts and has simple security story that is not subject to these kinds of surprises. And finally, anonymity has social issues. Um, when you make a network that allows anonymity, you start to have participants in that network that are not what most people want to have. And that's something that's been very difficult for projects like Tor to manage. And they're doing a great job. But that is another research area, and it's not our research area. And another, another aspect is that CJDNS is not DNS. DNS is actually a non-objective of CJDNS. And the reason is because it's actually a technically solved problem. The problem is political. If, if the problem was technical, then it would have been solved since years ago because of Namecoin. But it's, it's a political problem. It's all about what do we want the naming system to be. And that's a bigger problem than we're prepared to solve at this moment. So on the aspect of efficiency, I'm, I'm just like, there's a lot of projects that say, oh, we took X and put it on the blockchain, and therefore it's going to be better. And I want to distinguish this project from something like that, because you need to make efficiency. You need to make, I mean, we can want to do this, but our best, our best intentions will be only charitable work if we cannot make it economically efficient. And so there's two ways that we achieve an, an improvement in economic efficiency. One is the commoditization of bandwidth, and the other is division of labor. And these are really old techni techniques for making economic efficiency that have been used over and over. And uh, I have utmost confidence that this will work. So commoditization, what is, what is it to make a commodity? It's about making an open standard for, for a representation of a resource. Before commoditization, everything is unique, everything is different, and you can't compare things. And once you commoditize something, the, the commoditization makes that you're able to now compare different offers, and that allows the customer to switch between their providers more aggressively, and then providers begin to have to compete on price and quality. Commoditization is a great thing for the customer. It breaks monopolies and uh, it, it, makes, um, it makes things get a lot cheaper. Commoditization also, and this is something that is not obvious to as many people, it enables markets. And when I say markets, I don't mean markets like the store, I mean financial markets, which are markets that are uh, filled with people who are buying something because they expect to be able to sell it at a better price. And it's basically gambling, but this gambling is what makes the, the prediction market of the future price of an asset. And that is sort of a decentralized central planning. It's something that not a lot of people talk about, but it is really the brain of our modern economy. And while we know that these systems don't always work perfectly, they are pretty much the best thing that we know how to do. So it's very important to be aware of, of this aspect as well and what it can bring to, to us. And for example, the fact that you're able to buy food at the store, even when there's a drought, even when there's a shortage, even when there's supply problems, that is because of these people who are greedily working for themselves, but they're also working for making the economy stable. So the other aspect is division of labor, and this is a very old, this is a very old thing. It's, it's been, it existed for a long time, and since farmers figured out that they could specialize into becoming millers and bakers and other things, then it simplified what any one person needed to be capable of, and it allowed people to specialize, and more people could meaningfully participate in the economy because people didn't need to know how to do 
issues so much, and it allowed society to tackle more complex challenges. When I think about the, the, the expertise that I made use of on my way here to this event, um, I, I used a train, which is something massively complicated. I could have never built that train. I could have never built this computer. And all these things that are around us are things that we could never build alone. So this division of labor is one of the oldest and most powerful ways that we make better efficiency. So division of labor in the context of this project is about separating the infrastructure provider, that is the person who runs the server, runs the router, from the network operator. And the idea is that the infrastructure provider needs to know how to keep hardware operating and keep connections working. And it's a very local job. It's a, it's a job that you need to be on site in order to, to keep that stuff working. And we need lots of infrastructure providers. Now, a network operator, that is somebody who is thinking about routing data paths around the world, um, about predicting load, predicting how much bandwidth is going to be needed at a particular time. And this is a very global role. So you can think about this division as if you could buy a phone plan from any phone company in the world, and anybody could just set up a cell tower, and everybody was roaming all the time. That's kind of the concept. So you can buy a phone plan, and the, all the phone companies in the world are competing for your business, and anybody can pretty much just set up a cell tower with minimal technical experience. So on the agility side, agility is the ability of a system to evolve and embrace change. And it's important not only to be efficient in today's system, but it's also important to be agile toward tomorrow's. And in networking, a proven technique for increasing agility is by moving as much of the decision making from the core of the network to the edge as possible. You want the, the core of the network to be dumb. It's not exactly the same as decentralization, but it's very similar and it's, it's related. So I'm going to give you a, a little story about agility and moving logic from the core to the edge. Before the internet was a thing, uh, there was a lot of debate about um, how networking should work. And one of the popular ideas was that when, in order to make sure that everybody has enough bandwidth to send the data to where they need to send it, you should request the bandwidth before you send the data. And this idea came from the telephone system which, where you would reserve capacity when you're dialing the phone, you were actually setting up that path and you were reserving that capacity. And if you were unable to reserve the capacity in that time, then you would get a busy signal, even if the person at the other end was not on the phone. And this, while it worked in that very old telephone system, it proved really complex to scale because you needed the, all this logic for reserving slots in the core of the network. And it's just too complicated to reserve a connection every time you want to connect to a different website. So DARPA, the uh, US military, had this research project with this radical different idea, which was if you don't know if there's enough capacity to send the data, why not just send the data? And the core of the network would not have to care about reserving capacity. It would just handle data, and if there was too much, it would just discard some of it. And you would have the sender and recipient coordinate with each other to uh, make sure that everything was properly reserved, uh, uh, sorry, properly received. And this was uh, this is known as TCP/IP, and this has eventually it started out from kind of an anarchistic uh, research project, and it eventually took over the world, and it became the internet. And now this is the default. So. At the time, though, it wasn't obvious. It was not obvious that this was the right answer. And telecoms were not exactly awed by the cleverness of this pack, um, because it turns out that solving a hard problem by bypassing it doesn't impress the researchers who have been spending their time working on it. And this was sort of made worse by the fact that this experimental internet network was using telephone infrastructure in order to connect the routers. And um, there's a 
quote that I, I don't know the attribution of it, but somebody was said to have said, you, what you're doing is not networking. What you're doing is taking our network and making it worse because the telephone companies had a network which was reliable. You could be guaranteed that when you sent data, it was going to get there, and the Department of Defense was taking that and turning it into a network that was unreliable, that you couldn't be sure that the data was actually going to get there. They sort of had a point, but they, in the end, unreliable networking did win. So we, we take a couple lessons away from this. One is that moving decision making from the core of a network to the edge is a proven method of making a network more agile. And another is that if a system has better DNA, you know, better fundamental design of the system, it really doesn't matter if it's small at first because it will eventually grow and it, these ideas will eventually supplant the older ideas and older systems. So the idea of this project is, a big component of this idea is to move the route decisions to the edge as well. So when you send a packet on the internet, it only contains the address of its destination. This is a little bit technical. Now, imagine you're walking down the street and every time you hit a street corner, you ask directions. That wouldn't be very efficient. It would cost a lot of your time, it would cost a lot of time of the people standing on the street corner, but that is basically how the internet currently works works and it's a great system but I think we can still do better and one of the limitations of the system is that when the packets flow according to the way that routers want them to flow there's no way for the sender to control where that data goes when you send a packet of data in a CJDNS network it, the packet header contains exactly the path that that packet needs to take and this seems kind of like a, a small change, but it's very important because it's moving that intelligence about with, about routing from the core of the network to the edge of the network. And by moving it, the intelligence to the edge, you increase the agility of that network, as well as, of course, the efficiency of the routers in the core. So you need to have a path in order to send a packet, and how do you discover that? Well, there's two main lines of thinking right now. One is that you would send a query to your network operator. So you, thinking back to the, um, the phone provider, you ask your phone provider, hey, how do I get to Google? And they send you a path, and you use that path, and if the path has a problem, they send you another path. Um, another approach is the approach taken by Yggdrasil, which is to decentralize the, the, the routing protocol the protocol for discovering routes. What I want to impress upon you is the fact that CJDNS is capable of having both systems and even more systems all running in the same network because these are resolution, route resolution protocols and there's no reason why you can't have as many as you want in the same network even operating over the same physical nodes. So, that's kind of the high level vision. I want to get a bit into the implementation of where we are and where we intend to go with that. Um, so CJDNS, this is a project that has been in existence for some years now. It is an IPv6 network. The IP address is derived from your encryption key, so we don't need to ask somebody for addresses. Um, it has a VPN mode, so you can bridge it to the regular internet. Um, when my internet connection on this laptop is working, it's, it's using that, but right now I have no Wi-Fi. Everything's encrypted all the time. That's just a fundamental rule that, you know, all data ought to be encrypted for its recipient. That's just fundamentally good networking. And it uses the compressed source routing, which I was talking about, that you put the path that the packet should take in the packet so that routing decisions are made on the edge or are delegated to a, a server. Now, where we want to go with CJDNS is we want to introduce the, ask, the, the concept of a bandwidth lease. So once you set up a, a connection to another node, another router, you can lease bandwidth on that connection. And this idea is 
you would be able to basically say, okay, I have a 100 megabit connection, I will give a guarantee of 10 megabits so that in, in times of contention, when there's too much traffic, whoever has that 10 megabit lease is able to exploit at least 10 megabits of that connection. Again, we're not talking about preventing somebody from using the internet, the, the connection, when there's available bandwidth. We're talking about leasing the quality of service rights when, in times when there isn't enough. And the other aspect here, which is a little bit less obvious, is the virtual switch. Now, the virtual switch is a component of the um, of, of the CJDNS router itself, and you need virtual switches in order to connect bandwidth leases together. And the idea is that network operators, which is anybody who wants to get into the business of networking, is, is goes into the marketplace and buys bandwidth leases, and then they buy virtual switches and they ask the, the nodes to connect this lease to this switch and then th then they're able to get a, a, a whole virtual network that exists and you can have as many virtual networks as there are available virtual switches on the, the CJDNS node hardware and the amount of virtual switches is really a, a question of the hardware how much memory it has and uh, how, how fast the uh, chips are so this is where we want to go we're still going to be doing the source routing, but it's going to be source routed over virtual networks. And now, obviously, in order to make a decentralized bandwidth market work, we need some kind of a blockchain. Now, a, in this in this project, central a centralized bandwidth market is kind of a non-starter. We, we want to do this decentralized because we don't want any single point of failure. And we wanted simplicity, we wanted flexibility. Um, we needed something like the Lightning Network. A native blockchain made more sense than a token in this context because we could just modify that in order to do what we need to do. And and ICOs, I mean, in this project, nobody was really talking about ICOs ever. There was no serious talk about that. We judged that proof of stake was too complex and too risky for what we were doing. We want to innovate on the networking side, and we want to use more proven blockchain technology. So we had to use some kind of proof of work, but we wanted to, we, we approached the proof of work aspect more as an opportunity than as a problem. And the opportunity is that proof of work creates artificial demand. And I'm going to kind of examine what this artificial demand is. Take, for example, um, batteries and phones. Phones have not made batteries more expensive. According to the laws of supply and demand, you would think that now that we have phones, batteries would be, become expensive, and then electric vehicles would be prohibitively expensive because the batteries are being bought up by phones. No, it's not how it works. It makes it cheaper because what the economy, the uh, uh, supply and demand only works for in the short term. In the long term, you get economies of scale, and then the supply rises uh, to a huge amount of supply, and everything gets cheaper. Uh, it is same concept in solar panels. We have these subsidies for, for buying photovoltaic, and that has actually driven the price down, not up. And one of my favorites is the price of doing a SHA-256 operation. And you can, you can find that out by just taking the Bitcoin price and dividing the Bitcoin hash rate at, at any given time. And um, since 2010, it has fallen by over 99.99997%. Um, that kind of a collapse of price of anything is just astronomical. Um, to give you an example, it's like a 100,000 euro apartment selling for three cents. That, that's like post-scarcity kind of price collapse. And you know, if only SHA-256 was something we all needed, then even the fact that Bitcoin wastes SHA-256, it's still excellent because it's created this availability of SHA-256 for anybody who wants it. But the only problem is that we don't really need SHA-256. So, 
created a, um, a proof of work algorithm called PacketCrypt, and it's an algorithm that's based on the expenditure of bandwidth. So miners get a discount on the amount of work which they have to perform if they work together. So working together requires exchange of data, and that's where we use the bandwidth. And there's a bonus to this, which is that the, the CPU work, the actual work involved in PacketCrypt, is designed in order to perfectly mimic the encryption of packets on a network. So basically, the hash function in PacketCrypt is the same as the encrypt packet function for a VPN. And so we have packet, bandwidth hard proof of work, crypt, hashing based on encryption operations. And what that means is for any purpose built packet crypt miner, it's a trivial addition to make it capable of offloading VPN encryption as well. So if you build a hardware packet crypt miner, that chip, uh, it would be it would be foolish not to make that chip so that it can also encrypt traffic for VPN. This project based on packet crypt, we created a blockchain and we call it Packet or PKT. It is a Bitcoin derivative. It uses Packet Crypt as a proof of work and it has this concept called a network steward which gets 20% of all the newly mined coins. And the network steward is an elected address which I'll get into in a little bit. The basic uh, crypto economics of the project is uh, 6 billion coins in total, 6 million a day from day one, 10% decrease every 100 days. That's a smooth decrease which um, unlike the halving of Bitcoin, it actually prevents some kinds of problems related to the dramatic um, decrease of the halving, which ask me later. So, network steward, what is, what is this institution of the network steward? So, there's an address and it gets 20% of the coins from every newly mined block. But, unlike uh, a traditional founder's fee or an ICO or this type of thing, it can be replaced by a proof of stake vote. And the other rule that it has is that it must transact in the coins that it receives within 90 days or else they will burn. And that's that's in the code, it's a consensus rule. You, the network steward must make a grant of some sort, otherwise those coins become unusable. So, the network steward vote is based on a piece of additional data that's in the transaction output. Uh, you are able to vote for and against network steward addresses, and if more than half the coins in existence are voting against the current network steward, then it triggers this election event, and in the, in the election event, um, the network steward is replaced by whichever network steward has the most four votes. But every transaction, every output is able to do both a four and and against, and it's, it's counted uh, for both. Who is the network steward? Um, the current network steward is a multi-sig address with five people on it. Uh, that's Arcelor, um, the Yggdrasil release manager, um, Adonis Getznis, and myself. Um, Adonis is the creator of NetNinja VPN device, which is a hardware VPN project. Um, and so what do we do? Our objective is to deploy the coins that we have uh, in order to advance the packet ecosystem while protecting the fairness and values of the packet project. And we do that using competitive grant process to fund development. So now we talk about the values of the packet project and we get into what are those values. The packet project is an open source project. It is not a customer product. It is not something that's meant to be user facing. Um, we are not intent on doing any direct marketing. That's probably why you don't know about it. Um, it is meant for businesses and hackers to build things on top of. And then we expect that a business will enter into the ecosystem and, and productize parts of what we're doing. And then that product is something that can face a customer. Because we're not ready to, you know, an open source project is not prepared to make a product and do support on that product and all those aspects. And it's just not for us. We want to be an open ecosystem 
ecosystem for businesses to enter into and participate. And so we're very strict about segregating the project from the companies who are participating. And currently, there are two major participants um, so that we can be fair to everyone that's involved. And obviously, we're taking lessons from open source projects such as Linux and as well blockchain projects such as Bitcoin and Monero, which have been very good at achieving this, this strict separation. So now we get into the plan. I mean, this is an extremely ambitious project, obviously, um, and it's important to, to be clear that success only means that we're getting a little bit closer to the final objective every day. And the way that, uh, the way that we want to achieve this, and this plan is something that will be implemented by the participants of the project, by the companies, by the individuals, and the project itself will be really more the ownership of the protocols and protocol definitions by which the different software will interoperate and potentially the owner of a lot of the open source code. The, the open source code which makes the project work will be in the project space and then on top of that there will be different products that will be built by different organizations. So we're, we want to go immediately into a VPN marketplace because VPN is a fast way to get started with networking and make something that people can use and make immediate value. And then from the VPN marketplace, if we can get a device into everybody's house, which allows them to share internet with their neighbors, well, the VPN app can, uh, I'll just go into it. So the VPN marketplace, the idea is that anybody can just install a, a Docker image or something like that and run an exit node, and then they can offer VPN into the market to anybody who wants it. Obviously, free, except if there is network contention. Um, then you have a VPN app, which is a nice little app, and the app will connect to whichever exit node you ask, and you can pay in order to have priority in, so that you have a fast connection at peak times. From the VPN marketplace, we can go to internet sharing, which is just the ability to share your internet with your neighbor. That's the kind of the thing that free Wi-Fi does, except that instead of being owned by your ISP, it's owned by you. And because all the traffic will be going to a VPN, because it will be the VPN app that is the customer of this internet sharing thing, you don't have the legal risk of somebody using your internet. And again, it's paid for priority, and it's the same app that you use for the VPN that can also be used to connect to the neighbor's internet or the internet at the coffee shop or at the hotel. So once we get internet sharing working, it's kind of obvious that local mesh networking is not that difficult to do because, I mean, what is it other than basically sharing your neighbor's internet with your other neighbor? And the famous complexity of operating a mesh network can be moved away from the people who are actually installing and operating that infrastructure to the network operator. And the network operator can figure out how to route the data through that mesh network and how to deal with outages and all the different problems that you encounter when you try to do a mesh network. And that frees up the local mesh network people to be able to just set up some infrastructure and have it working. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. Um, used about half of my time. And I just want to, you know, we have a, a Telegram chat, we have an IRC. Um, you can contact me if you want more information about this. And I just want to kind of leave with you this idea that a VPN, I mean, it's a, if people were not crying out for better networking, for a better internet, then we wouldn't have so many VPNs. We wouldn't have people, people are literally paying for their internet twice. They're paying their ISP and then they're paying again for a better ISP. So I think that it, the time really is now for better internet and um, this is, uh, and, well, I hope this is the project to do it. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have lots of time. Yeah, theory, go ahead. <laughs> I, can't, I can't hear a thing. Network neutrality.
neutrality? Yes, that is an incredibly good question. So the idea of network neutrality is that uh, access to everything should be the same price. So, and that makes a lot of sense because we're talking about uh, single points of failure, and then single point of failure, which is in the objectives here. Um, it is. So we don't want to have this political single point of failure which can decide which websites you're able to go to and which ones are going to be slow and useless and you shouldn't use them. That, that would be, that's stepping on the, the economics, of, it's stepping on that whole, the whole beautiful thing that is the internet where everybody can just make a website. And network neutrality, in the system that we're in, network neutrality makes a lot of sense, but economically, network neutrality is, is fundamentally indefensible. And the, the reason why that is, is because if the other side of that connection is willing to foot the bill for getting the data from you to them, then they will find a way to do that. There's no way that we can make it so that if Google or Facebook or whoever wants to be faster than another, um, another provider, what they're gonna do is they're going to put their own network up close to your to you and, and they're going to bring fast internet that only works for their website we can do certain things we can do we can make it so that it's fair but we can't make it so that a provider who wants to spend money to make your connection to their site faster can't do that does that answer your question into the, the fold that's going to make um, 
bandwidth become more and more and more available. So this is the commoditization and the financial market aspect, which I think distinguishes this project from a project like Helium or a project like Orchid. And then there are some really great projects which are a lot less financial oriented, like um, Althea Mesh Network, which I, I'm a huge fan of their project. Um, they're, they're just hit the ground running. They're, they're putting in mesh networking. And what they're doing is you pay when you use the internet from the neighbor. And the difference here is that what we're looking to do is tokenize the bandwidth lease and then sell that into a financial market where people can speculate on it. And then from that, we would bring it to a network operator, which is this uh, any cell phone company in the world. And then from that, we'll bring it to the person and that network operator will be able to make you a deal like you know simple 20 euros a month for unlimited internet. These kinds of deals are what they'll be able to do instead of uh, complicated deals where you might use a lot of, of, uh, of, of currency, you might use a little bit, you're not really sure how much because um, the reality of, of networks and incentivized networks is complicated. And so we're pushing that complexity over to the network operator. Does that answer your question? to install CJDNS and wants to install the, the packet software and sync the blockchain on their on their computer um, and, and set up a wallet and do some mining. So we'll be going right over there in 15 minutes or 10 minutes now. Um, and uh, so I just uh, just wanted to put that out there. If you have a computer, it's got to be um, uh, Mac or Linux because uh, Windows support is still a bit lacking. We're not making, again, we're not making a customer product here. We're making a, a, a back end for hackers and for companies to use to build that customer product. So it's it's all very, um, very raw. And um, also, you can go to um, pkt.cash and you can you can read about the project. You know, we have some uh, some explanation of what the project is, what we're trying to do, and, um, you know, again, we're, we're not, this is kind of, it's, it's simple, but it's intentionally simple because we're not trying to attract a lot of hype, you know, we're trying to build technology, we're, we want technologists to be involved and we want people to take this and turn it into a product, we're not making a product and we're definitely not making um, a speculative bubble. Questions? Okay. Well, what we can do is uh, we have about ten minutes until we have to go. So what I'm thinking we'll do is just can I see a show of hands? Does anybody want to try the install CJDNS install packet um, uh, workshop? Is it, if nobody wants to do the workshop, then we'll, we'll just wrap it up. Is, is here want to do an installation of these uh, of these pieces of software okay so that'll be easy then because you know we'll just sit in a circle and uh, be able to do it like that um, I don't really have a lot a lot left so why don't we just wrap it up here and um, we'll take it over to the, uh, the, the workshop space and uh, continue like that. And we can also do a question and answer if anybody has any questions about what we're trying to do. Thank you very much.